Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening in today's episode? In this episode, we're going to talk about the first women historians, and then we're going to do a deep dive into primary source materials and how they can help us get women's stories into the classroom. Specifically, we're going to be talking about World War II. Okay, awesome. Let's get into this. Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%, the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. Episode 15, Primary Sources and Women's History. Brooke, this week, we're going to talk about the first women historians. Are you ready? Yes, ma'am. Um, we don't talk about first all that often, or try not to. I know. So what made you decide on doing this one? Well... So a big theme in women's history and, like, why it's not being taught is because women aren't writing history. And so I got curious at one point, like, who the heck these first women historians were and why did they write? So um, I did a little searching for who the first women historians were. and. Um, in the Western world, I came up with a name. She was a Byzantine woman, and we'll talk about her in the second part here. But For those that don't know, Byzantine is? Byzantine. So, yeah, so the Byzantine Empire is in... Um, in Rome, in ancient Rome. Um, the empire kind of begins to crumble um, and it divides because first of all it's huge right it expands it, it expands the entire Mediterranean yeah and um, the empire uh, can't be you know you can't govern that well in that time they had a really hard time governing and controlling and actually maintaining peace in that wide of a area and so the empire divides and it becomes the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire and like Turkey-ish is the Byzantine Empire, modern-day okay. Turkey. But they have, like, all of Israel and Egypt and all it's of that. It's, it's a very big empire when it first um, is is there. And so in so um, the Byzantine Empire exists for a really long time. It is interesting. So the first woman historian there um, is, is credited in the Western world as being the first woman okay. historian. But I started, you know, when I started thinking about my history classes and trying to have a more multicultural, global perspective on things, I started to realize that what the Western world says is first sometimes isn't what's first to, like, the Chinese or the Indian. So surprising. Yeah, I know. (laughs) The first actual woman historian is not in the Byzantine Empire, and she's actually Chinese. And um, she's really interesting. Her name is Van Zhao. And one of the themes with women historians, and probably with a lot of historians, is that you are a little bit privileged to have time in your day to sit around and study books and look at sources and... Um, you have to be wealthy enough, right? Like you can't have sources and writing material and to act, have access to a library. Right. Okay. So first historians in general are probably very elite, um, people, very educated elite people. Okay. And this is absolutely true of Banzo. She and her family, uh, live in the Imperial court. Um, she is very, very wealthy. She's super close with the Empress. Um, okay. and you know, pretty much has like a lovely, I would love to trade lives. Um, well actually, no, there's no time in history that I want to go back to. Never mind. I take no, that back. No, thank you. But she is privileged. <laughs> She's very privileged. Um, so her dad starts writing a history of China. And... Um, She's living... She's uh, she, raised by a historian. She's raised by a historian. And she. Uh, so he starts writing a history of the Han Empire, which is when she's living. And um, he dies while writing his history. Okay. And so she sort of picks up her dad's book and finishes it. And that is, I think, in and of itself, very, very interesting. Yeah. His book had 
he had like outlined the whole thing. And so she had a, a sense of where it was going and began to sort of fill in the gaps of what he had had left. And it was a very, very ambitious book. And it doesn't surprise, like a lot of pe- the historians who talk about this, it, they're not surprised at all that he wasn't able to finish. Oh, really? Because it was such an it undertaking. It was a huge undertaking. So, um, so she's, she's really interesting in that she basically helps finish this story. Okay. Her history and her and her dad's history in in and of itself isn't very cool. But what I mean, what is cool Noble. about yeah, what it's 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 there and it's neat. But what's interesting about her is that she actually goes on to write a lot more. Oh, she so writes finishes her dad's book and now she's on the hunt for she, more. Yeah, and so she writes um, the most. The, her most famous writing is actually like the probably the most famous thing written by a woman in China. Period, and um, so she's you know in the Han Empire, Confucianism is incredibly important, and Confucianism emphasizes this is a philosophy. It's not really a religion, but it's a philosophy that kind of dominates Chinese thought and um, and and intellectualism. And there are lots of people that rejected Confucianist thinking, and there's okay. you know kind of like. Um, different parts of the world go back and forth from different religions. That's definitely true in in China. There's resistance to Confucianism. But um, it emphasizes very strict hierarchies within families and within society. And so um, there's when I traveled to to China, for example, um, my professor uh, who was a political science professor taking us there, he was older and had white hair and so he actually had us all line up um in our strict sort of confucian hierarchy and so we lined up by age and um and then within that if you were close in age to a boy student on our trip to china um i had to go below them because they were male and so being male sort of puts you ahead and then being older sort of puts you ahead in the social hierarchy and of course our male professor with his, you know, white hair and like symbol of wisdom. He was, you know, the top and he had us all stand there. And, um, you know, he said, look to your right. These are the people that you need to look up to. These are the people that are your role models and that will protect you. And everybody looked to your left. And I happened to be the youngest person on the abroad. Actually, I wasn't the youngest, but the youngest person was male. So he was he bump up. bumped up. So I looked to my left, no one's there. And it's like, these are the people that you need to protect. <laughs> like, Great, I'm Great. free on this trip. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. See you at the bar later, Professor. See ya. <laughs> yeah. So um, so anyway, so Confucianism has these really strict hierarchies and um, they value filial piety, which is basically this idea of respecting the um, authority of the of your household. The, your household and the people that are that are above you, and so she, her writing, just like anybody's writing, is not immune to its time, and so she wrote a book which is basically um, a philosophy for women about how they should be educated and how they should be um, raised and what they should be doing yeah. inside the home. So. Um, obviously I'm reading an English translation, but she said, a woman ought to have four qualifications, womanly virtue, womanly words, womanly bearing, and womanly work. Now what is called womanly virtue need not be brilliant ability, uh, exceptionally different from others. Womanly words need, uh, need be neither clever in debate nor keen in conversation. Womanly appearance requires neither a pretty nor perfect face and form. Womanly work need not be work done more skillfully than that of others. Interesting. Yeah, and she kind of uh, begins a trend, which are that a lot of early women writers write about how women should behave and give these sort of recommendations to women. I think it's interesting that she basically is like, yeah, mediocre work for women is cool. And... (laughs) and, um, I know. What is your takeaway from that? Like what she said there. Why is that so crucial for you? Well, I think it's interesting because her book is basically cited for centuries on how women should act in China. And feminist writers in in China basically, you know, around in the 20th century start looking at her writing and being like, 
what? <laughs> you know, and, and like, you don't need to be clever. You don't need to be able to debate people. Like, and that's all they've kind of learned for a while is how to be that, that your education can be sort of stifled because the bar for women is lower uh-huh. in terms of what they need to be able to do. And at least that's my reading of this English translation. Um, so It's interesting because, you know, we like to think that, like, women are these big advocates for other women, and sometimes they're not. And Banzao is an interesting example where at least she's advocating for women to be educated, period. Um, (laughs) We'll take that as the win. We'll take that for the win. Um, But it is definitely, um, you know, you don't have to be keen in conversation. I think those types of things are kind of like... Oh, but women could be, and but I, but in some ways, maybe it's like you don't have to be. You don't have to be everything because your responsibilities are multi. Yeah, and like you ha- don't have to be exceptional at all. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but she definitely joins the bandwagon of Confucian thinkers that stress that women's responsibility is to the male figures in her home, and that you know they get that sort of supreme authority. Um, She encourages women to go about their work wholeheartedly and to submit to her husband and his family in all things. In China, it's very common for the girl to leave her home and go live with her husband and his His family. family. So, um, so you, you know, when you get a mother-in-law, like she sort of becomes your boss in, in the domestic work, um, so, yeah, I don't know, like, what kind of pressure Banzao felt to uphold ideals of male domination and superiority well, in her writing. If she's in a privileged position, more than likely people are trying to probably marry her and be related to her, especially if she's not protected by a man any longer, if her father's not there. Yeah. I don't know what that culture says about, like, being a single woman unmarried. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know about her married life too much. Um, I do know that when she was when she died, um, the empress actually honored her, um, and I think that's kind of interesting. Um, she she has this like great ceremony from the empress, but then a lot of people point out that like male scholars from that point forward kind of diminish her writing, and um, so I think. You know, it's something that's, like, revived as Confucianism is strong and then sort of disappears when it's when it's not. Um, and then the other problem with her work is that intellectually, because, I mean, this is one of... She's in the imperial court. Right. She has access to books and libraries that nobody else does. She is educated and literate. And so there probably aren't very many women who in China at the time that actually, like, read her work. So So she's writing to a zero audience, essentially. Right. So, like, that's probably another piece of why her writing gets ignored, because, like, what women are actually capable of reading her recommendations. Interesting. Okay. So back in the Byzantine Empire, we have our first sort of Western historian. And... She is also incredibly privileged. She is the daughter of the emperor, and um, she is... So her dad dies, and her brother assumes the throne. Right. Succession. Succession. She is married to a very powerful man, and she wants her husband to overthrow her brother. Oh, get it. Okay. And so she plots to overthrow her brother with her husband and her... Is she older than her brother? Oh, good question. I don't know. I don't know. That would be curious. Just of like, I was born before you, but you get the throne because you're a man. Like, I'd be so curious if that's why she comes for him. Yeah, maybe. Her name is Anna Kamnena, and she is just fascinating because she is trying to overthrow her brother. Okay. They get obviously caught. And so she is um, punished by having to live out the rest of her days in a monastery with a bunch of monks. So exile. Exile. Monks have historically lots of books. Lots of books. Huge libraries. Excellent writers. Yeah. I mean, they are the epicenter of intellectualism. So here's a brilliant woman who wants power, can't have it, and is surrounded by 
books. And so she decides to write a history while she's in exile. And yeah, she's really fascinating. Um, So she's imprisoned in the 12th century and she writes a 15 volume historical account based on records that were available at the covenant in her, uh, based on her own experience, because she's also like a woman who's privy to all sorts of things that are yeah, going she's been on in court for years. And right, and behind the scenes and her dad and her brother are both incredibly powerful. Well, she probably was educated at the palace as well about her family's history and what makes them, you know, why they're in empire. Yeah. blah blah. blah. She, um, she's her history is actually really cool because she's one of the uh only Byzantine um, perspectives on the First Crusades, which came from Western Roman Empire to kind of reconquer Jerusalem. And um, so she has this very, like, contemptuous view of Western Roman people. And that comes across in her history. Um, She's actually a lot more accurate than some of her male historians because... Yeah, like, these early historians love to over-exaggerate figures Figures and that type of thing. And she definitely has her biases, don't get me wrong. But she, um, apparently she was more accurate than other contemporary male historians. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, she is biased towards her father and definitely glosses over some of his failings as a ruler. Um, but she wrote of her repugnance of her husband's timidity and his failure to secure the throne. She kind of like throws him under the oh, bus. No. Yeah, and she speculated that, quote, perhaps their genders should have been reversed, end quote. This is, like, the first time we're seeing it. Yeah. It's like, oh, you wanted to be a dude? That's so surprising. Well, she's like, listen, like, you were weak and couldn't overthrow my brother. Like, let me at him. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like, because I'm a woman, I can't, and I needed you to do this, and you're not capable. Yeah. So... I wouldn't say that Banzao, it, like, is intending to be hurtful to women, but I thought that it was interesting that um, Anna takes a moment in her writing to really honor her grandmother. So I wanted to read a little bit about what she says about her grandmother. Nice. So this is her her dad's mom, right? Okay. Her dad who was is, who is ruler. She says, It may cause some surprise that my father, the emperor, had raised his mother to such a position of honor and that he had handed complete power over to her. Yielding up the reins of government, one might say, he ran alongside her as she drove the imperial chariot. Chariot. My father reserved for himself the waging of wars against the barbarians while he entrusted to his mother the administration of state affairs, the choosing of civil servants, and the fiscal management of empire's revenue and expenses. One might perhaps in reading this blame my father's decision to entrust the imperial government to the gynaceum, which I had to look that up. Um, yeah, like, <laughs> this, is, sorry, what is that? this is the woman's sphere within the home. So, okay. like, I, I see the root, like, gynecology there, yeah. right? So she's, so, like, the woman's half. And, like, he's letting his mom wear the pants, basically. And, but once you understood the ability of this woman, her work, her excellence, her good sense, and her remarkable capacity for hard work, you would turn from criticism to admiration. For my grandmother really had the gift of conducting the affairs of state. She knew so well how to organize and administer that she was capable of governing not only the Roman Empire. Oh, by the way, Byzantines don't adopt that name. They consider themselves the Eastern Roman, Eastern Roman Empire. Um, but also every other kingdom under the sun. She was very shrewd in seizing on whatever was called for and clever in carrying out with certitude. Not only did she have an outstanding intelligence, but her powers of speech matched it. She was a truly pervasive Uh, persuasive orator, in no way wordy or long-winded. As for her compassion toward the poor and the lavishness of her hand toward the destitute, how can words describe these things? Her house was a shelter for the needy relatives, and it was no less a haven for strangers. Her expression, which revealed her true character, demanded the worship of the angels, but struck terror among demons. I just thought that was really beautiful, like defending her grandmother's... Ability to govern. Yeah, and like holding a position of power and basically being like if you're criticizing my dad for putting her there like you are you know you're you're underestimating her. You're underestimating her and you're being sexist. Yeah. I also think it's really cool because, you know, she has this strong female role model that is in a position of power, doing incredible work 
at the helm next to the king. And, like, maybe she had the vision, too, that, like, if, when her brother got into power, that he might utilize her in the same regard. And he didn't. And he didn't. And, like, kind of calling it out here of, like, this was an opportunity that my grandmother had, not only because she was a woman, but because she deserved it. Right. Like, she was smart. She knew what she was doing. She was in a position of power. And she probably ruled alongside her husband for some time as well, you know, guiding him and his decisions, which, you know, makes you an exceptional, you know, person to guide a new leader as well, which would be your son. Right. Right. Very interesting. So those are the two firsts, basically. I would say Ben Zhao was probably first. And maybe some people don't credit her because she sort of picks up her dad's book and finishes it, and it's not, like, entirely hers. Does she get credit for it? She does. <laughs> um, but Anna also, like, even in her time, her book doesn't rise to the prominence that male historians get in, in her era. Um, but not, like... No matter what, their writing is significant, and because they're writing about their time, and they're giving us a perspective that male historians can't. Right. And um, and so I think that that is really cool, and I think modern historians should cite them because we don't need to like just because people were sexist. Yeah. Then like we can we can cite these women because they have really interesting perspectives and really interesting access that other people didn't have. Um. Following them, basically, I mean, the big, the underlying theme here, though, is that only really, really elite women. I mean, we're talking about yeah. royalty in both, exactly. cases. in both cases. Only really, really elite women have the educations and the access to libraries to do this. Right. And so... I imagine we can see this time and time again throughout history that that's who's taking up the cause of writing down history or writing at all is a position of power and privilege that a woman has, you know, and I think we talked about it a couple episodes ago of, like, the the woman from New Hampshire who was uh, in a position of servitude. Yeah, and like, Harriet Wilson. Yes, and, like, how incredible her story is and the fact that she had no power. Right. She's a woman of color. Right. And writing. Writing. Yep. It's like that is triumphantly amazing and uphill battle. Yeah. Not that these women ha- didn't have a battle in their own time that they were women. But right. Very interesting that that it is typically a person of privilege. Right. Well, and I I know that in the West in particular, and I mean like the Western world, um, it's really not until the Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Reformation that you begin to see women getting educated. Um, Martin Luther is not a champion for women at all, but he is a champion for women's education because he believes that people need to read the Bible. Right. And so he wants women to be able to, like, read. read. And and so it's kind of this, like, I don't have really high opinions about women, but they should be able to read because, yeah. you know, that's this is the holy book. And, um, and so that's really when we start seeing lots of women from all walks of life being able to be in a position to at least write down their stories. Right. Um, so I think it's hard because the position, I mean, and, but this is, but this is also true of most, you know, most histories that are early, they're being written by really, really wealthy, privileged people who have, who don't need to worry about famine, who don't need to worry about right. their, you know, their well, crop. Their basic needs are being well met yep. where they can have intellectual thought and room for it. Right. Totally. So the next Like, in history, when you look at, like, when do women really begin writing histories, it's not really until women start going to college in the late 1800s. Wow. Yeah. And so that's when you start seeing, like, historian after historian after historian. And so so we're talking literally, like, eight centuries go by between these women that I just mentioned. And And there's possibly women between then and... and, Oh, there's definitely women between then. But more well-known ones are in the 1800s. Well, women's history as like a field and and women historians like engaging in in the topic in the topic. I mean, we've mentioned Mercy Otis Warren. Right. She wrote okay. the first, the history of the American Revolution, right? But she is a a woman, another privileged, privileged. woman yep. on her own writing her story. 
And so I think I think that it's, it's it's important to understand that like one of the reasons why there is a ton available to us about women in the 20th century is because we also have women historians writing their stories down. Right. And we didn't necessarily have that for the centuries prior. Um so and and I think the really sad thing is that we tend to empathize and be interested in people that are like us. And so men in history are not interested in the issues of the domestic sphere, the the female perspective on wars and conflicts when they're not in the situation room, like that type of thing. So... So they're not like, you know, let's get a holistic view of whatever we're talking about here and we'll go out and interview a couple women. It's like, no, no, we've got all we need to move this forward. Right. Moving on and they just leave them out. Right. Well, and I think that's, you know, this is kind of an enduring problem. Like the people like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton helped write the history of women's suffrage. And that's kind of problematic because those two women kind of ignore some of the African-American women that are, you know, along with them. So, you know, Plato says those who control this, uh, tell the story, hold the power. And I think that is so true because we look back on history and we say, well, women weren't there. Well, yeah, they were, (laughs) they were there. They just maybe not, were not in a position to write their stories down. Okay. So, um, where do you bring this into your classroom? Well, so I don't necessarily bring the history of women's history into my classroom specifically, but I think it's helpful to understand that this, like to look to women historians for the information is actually really hard to do. And so, um, are they there? Yeah. And if you look for them, there's a lot that you could like grab grab from, um, But it's definitely not as abundant as the many male historians who have written down many resources, many resources. Yeah. So um, so I am not the first person to say this and I'm probably not going to be the last person to say this, (laughs) but for women and insert any minority group here. Yeah. The way you bring their story in is you don't go to the history books. You go to the source material that historians would have used. Right. So you go primary. You go primary. sources you can find. Right. And honestly, like, what I want is why I want my kids to understand what historians do and, like, how to actually research. Right. And this is transferable to law, to political science, to economics. Like, this is what the social sciences do. I do want my students to be able to understand that the his, the women's historians aren't there to, to draw from. And this is what you're trying to get your students to get to, is go look for primary sources. Don't just read a generalized statement from a multitude of different historians who wrote a book. The primary material is there, and I think, honestly, it takes women scholars to make, you know, lay people like me who are just history teachers in a classroom aware that it's there, um, but but it's there. And, and if we use that primary material, if we look for, even if you take a lesson that you already teach, say you teach a lesson on Confucianism, Google, like, I don't know, what do, what do women think about <laughs> Confucianism? Yes. Yeah. And, and maybe the woman is writing in 1960, but that's cool. Use it, you know? Um, yeah, if we're going to make strides towards more women being in the content, then you do have to kind of rattle up what you're currently doing. I mean, I think, you know, that's one thing in education that they have. They're like, all right, get your lesson plans done. If you get that same class next year, you already have your model made. Right. It's like, no, we should always be looking at it and saying, how do we challenge this differently and make it more interesting for ourselves? I mean, you as a teacher, it's more interesting when you get to create new material and present new ideas Mm -hmm. and how it lands. So that's awesome that you were able to do that with your class. To I mean, a lesson that you've probably done for what? the last five years, if not longer. Yeah. Well, and honestly, some of it's like on the fly. Like one day I didn't have time to prepare anything, but I had just read something from, you know, a woman historian. And so I read that to my class. I just stood there with the book and I read it to them. I was like, wait, you guys just learned this whole thing. And I had them, I was like, quick scan, look at all the documents. How many women did they mention? My kids were like zero. And I was like, cool. Okay. So here's what I'm going to read to you. And it was, you know, it's kind of boring. It probably wasn't like the most engaging thing but I think the kids were interested because well I also teach older kids but the kids were interested because they were like whoa not a single woman was mentioned 
and like okay it is virginia in you know whatever yeah, and women lived there <laughs> Lim- women lived there and granted there were fewer of them than there were men but like yeah you know, anyway, so that that was really interesting. For the second half of the podcast, we're going to talk about Nazi Germany and some of the women that are important primary sources there. I think it's worth noting that we all know that the Nazis burned books. What we might not realize is that a lot of the books they were burning were written by women because... Here are women who are talking about things that do not support the Nazi cause. Right. Many of the women writers were being like, um, Nazis, oh. terrible, bad plan. Yeah. And um, and so those women's books get burned. Um, Vicki Baum, she wrote um, novels with a strong female protagonist. How dare she? So her books got burned. Um I'm going to butcher some of this German, but Gertrude von Puttkammer wrote Lesbian Erotica. That got burned. Um, Anna Reiling wrote uh, A Warning About Nazism. Bertha von Suttner was the second woman to receive the Nobel Peace Prize for her writings on peace in the lead-up to World War I. Her books got burned. Um... And so, you know, she because they're writing about peace, because they're writing against Nazism, because they're writing against everything that the Nazis stand for, their books get destroyed. And so I think it's also worth noting that, like, not only are women writers scarce, but they're also, like, sometimes, in the case of the Nazis, like erased. erased or repressed. Yeah. Wow. So we're going to talk about the Nazis for the second half here. So we're going to take a short break. And we'll oh, be right back. Breaks. Okay. For lesson plan ideas and how to teach women's history, visit our website, www.remedialherstory.com. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Remedial Herstory. If you think what we're doing is needed, please consider joining our Patreon community. Patreon allows you to sponsor a podcast with a small donation. Patrons get access to bonus materials, extended episodes, insider information, and gear. Give at whatever level you can. Patrons who give at the $25 tier will receive a Remedial Herstory mug and a booklet of all the Remedial Herstory lesson plans and resources. We want to sincerely thank some of our patrons for their contributions. Sarah Reardon from New Hampshire is an architect, but supports us to be re-educated. She was one of our first giveaway winners, too. Leah Tanger contributes what she can to keep the show going. Thank you both for your commitment to women's history, and thank you to all of our patrons. All right, welcome back, everybody. So, Brooke, we're going to talk about Nazi Germany, which... Sorry, it's like tipping. No, it's okay. Which is obviously a really tough topic to discuss yeah um the holocaust is really horrible um obviously and for what what struck me recently was that probably the most well-known primary source from that entire conflict is Anne Frank's diary oh my gosh yeah and I was like oh it's a girl it's a woman it's not you know here is a it's not even just a woman it's a it's a teenager. Yeah. This young Jewish girl who's hiding in an attic yep. with her family and writing about what that was like. And it, it's a book. Do you think that most schools <coughs> use Anne Frank as a, as a source? We read it a lot, and anyone I brought it up with in college knew of Anne Frank. Yeah. I feel like it's a, definitely a hot topic in, like, an English class. Yeah. Um, there's a big movement that bums me out as a social studies teacher away from reading full books in English classes. And it bums me out because in my class, we read a lot of short primary sources. Well, yeah, and like articles. And articles and, you know, little bits for content. Yeah. And I would love for kids to have time in their English class to like, just read a story yeah from from beginning to end beginning to yeah I hope that's not the case it I know that there are some teachers that are not doing that but I definitely you know there's 
there's so much depth to gain from a full novel. Yeah. And I wish, I hope kids are reading that. I know that I read Anne Frank's diary when I was in, um, I think, middle school. I think yeah. it's written at more of like a middle school reading level. It's definitely like seventh grade. I feel like we dove into it. Yeah. We did a hybrid when I was in seventh grade of our history teacher and our English teacher both covered uh, World War II and the Nazis at the same time. So we got a lot of content. Awesome. And I think that's one of the best things to do because what we're teaching in the history class is supplemented, right? They know about the wars. They know who Hitler is. They know, you know, um, they might know like Winston Churchill or, you know, Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that I think, I think that's a really lovely way to do it. So it, it just strikes me that here is one of the exceptions to kind of the long rule of well, women's history is sort of left out, and like, yet here's Anne Frank, right. and um, and I also think she kind of is unlike, you know, the two women historians that I talked about in the first part, because not from a place of privilege, she's not writing from a place of privilege, and yet her work is like so inspiring, and she takes talks about the most simple things that are so yeah. meaningful to her, and. Um, Gosh, what a cool thing to help you understand well, this get conflict. Into the mind of someone living in that time. It's amazing. Right. And if you hold that up against some of the other primary sources of the material that are saying all of these horrible things about Jewish people, mm. and you say, okay, here's one of those people that you think is worth exterminating look what she's saying, look what she's worried about, look what she's thinking about. This is a girl. This is not... a person. This is a person. Um, And feelings and thoughts and emotions and family and love. It's like, no, this isn't just a thing to discard. Right. So those primary sources really make things real. And I think in a history class, you could absolutely use Anne Frank. I love that. You can hook up with your cool English pal that (laughs) would want to teach that at the same time. Yeah, totally. Um, so oral history, you know, for people that lived in those camps and like, you know, maybe survived the camps or didn't survive the camp, the way that you tell their story, because they probably were not given pen and paper to record and document everything Uh, that happened to them. I can imagine that that's true. The way you tell their story is you take down oral histories. And there have been a lot of people since World War II who went around and collected oral histories of people who survived camps. And what was their story? There's so many at the National Holocaust Museum, which is like, oh my gosh, there's right. so much detail there. Yeah. I Every time I go through that museum, you're talking about the one in D.C.? Yes. Is that what it's called? Um, the yeah American Holocaust Museum. Okay. Yeah. Um, or National Holocaust Museum, but yeah, that and and that that place has a really cool, you know, story in and of itself. Because when it opened, some guy, like a Holocaust denier, came with a gun and shot a cop who was like guarding the place. I mean, it's a really, like, it's very cool in and of itself. It's historical in and of itself. Yeah, absolutely. We had um, a Holocaust survivor come speak at our school, which there are very few left. Yeah, you know, especially those that survived concentration camps. Um, but it just made it real. Yeah, that a person. This is a, a living being went through that. And it doesn't make it so distant. It makes it very real. The National World War II Museum has... Ta- I mean, the Holocaust Museum itself is very cool to walk through. Yeah. But... Uh, the National World War II Museum is an online museum for people to go in, and they have oral histories recorded. You could, like, play oral histories, oral histories play the video uh, for your class of a person who survived the concentration camp. Because you're right, they're not left. There's not a lot left, so you can't necessarily bring them to your, to your classroom class, or yeah. go meet one. Um, but there's all sorts of... And talk about telling diverse histories. Oh I, found, uh, I found a video of a Japanese-American man talking about what it was like to be enlisted as a Japanese American the day that Pearl Harbor happened. Uh, you know, like there is very cool stuff in there. That's wild. Yeah. Um, so, so there are all these oral histories that exist, and um, and I think World War II in particular, it's so documented. Tell the stories. Let the people tell their own stories and give their firsthand accounts. Um, there's a woman who. Um, was in Auschwitz, and um, this is obviously perhaps the most hellish of the concentration camps, if that's a thing, if that's a term. 
and her name is Stanislava Lechiska. She was interned for two years at Auschwitz, and when she arrived, she um, notified the doctor that she was a midwife. And uh, the the camp doctor, you know, okay. the German in charge, yeah. and um, so she actually, while she's serving there, her she basically her job in the camp is to help deliver babies that are born in the constant right in the concentration camp, and that in and of itself is just crazy. That like you are captured, people that you know have been sent to the gas chambers. And yet you still have to give service. Your your but like women are still giving birth. Like life is going on in this and new life is happening here. And I can't imagine going into these camps being pregnant. Right? Like what a traumatic experience. And then to be separated from your your spouse and your family through all of that and they have no idea where, where you are or if you're okay. But then to be a midwife and to see these women through these experiences and to carry that burden? Yep. Wow. Yeah. So a so lot of... we know of her? Because a lot of women who survived the camp told her story. Wow. So she's incredible. Um, she grew up in Poland. And this is, uh, I think, something that we... When we talk about the Jewish Holocaust, right? Yeah. The, we sort of neglect the the full story, which is, yes, lots of Jewish people died on, at the hands of the Nazis, but the Nazis were out for lots of different groups of people. Yeah, not just Jewish. The gypsies, the Polish, the, um, you know, the underserved, the homosexuals, the, like, poor people, right? Anyone who was against them would go. Any resi- yeah, anybody who resisted, Any, right? like, artisan culture that was possibly, you know, trying to... Socialists, yep. communists... So there's a long list of people that were targeted and imprisoned in these camps. And um, when the Nazis come through Poland, they are interning people left and right. And so this woman is interned because she's because she's Polish. She lived in a ghetto and was helping to kind of um, get people uh, resources and and resist and, and get people out of the ghetto. And her family was basically discovered. And so they were interrogated by the Gestapo and she gets shipped off to to a camp. Um. So she is with her daughter, who is a medical student. Her husband kept fighting the Nazis outside, um, but he ends up getting killed in the Warsaw Uprising in 1944. So she never sees him again. Yeah. So she... She just has one daughter? She has a daughter that's with her. Um, So... um, And she's separated from her sons, too. So um, she does have sons. Um, So... But her husband escapes along with an older son, and, and they are outside and resisting and they he They're the husband battle. yeah her husband ends up dying so when she arrives in the camp she tells them that she's a midwife and um, she gets sent to the maternity ward and um, basically she's there to care for the pregnant women and it's kind of interesting that um, first of all in a place where they're gassing people they don't, like, why so would they even take the time to, to allow women to give birth right like is that their one inch of humanity that they're willing to give up like oh she's pregnant well i guess we can't kill her no so most pregnant women when they arrived at the camp and it's very obvious that they are pregnant they are immediately sent to gas chambers because oh, so they don't women that got pregnant while there so they could have been gotten pregnant while there um or they were um like early enough along that it wasn't evident Showing, that they yeah. were pregnant. Um, a lot of people, when they found out, um, they were sometimes given abortions by one of the, um, by Gisela Pearl, who was a doctor who helped prevent hundreds of women from giving birth. Um, often they were just, if they were found out to be pregnant, that was like the death sentence, basically. Oh my goodness. So, which like, I can't even imagine, you know, like you might have a chance if you aren't pregnant. So how do you? What about all the women that were raped by soldiers too? Right. If they got pregnant. Right. A lot of the women, and this is horrible. So for our listeners, if you really can't handle some of the more gruesome things, this is probably a tough one to swallow. Um, When babies were born, the German doctors declared them stillborn, even if they weren't, and killed them. 
Mm-hmm. And so these women would who who somehow got to the point where they were giving birth would give birth to babies and and know that that baby would go on and and be killed. It's incredible that their their bodies even allowed them to give birth in such trauma. Yeah. And to go through that feat to have a potential healthy baby, but then to only go through all of that struggle for someone then to end your child's life. I just, it's unreal. Yeah. Yeah. It's like hard to even fathom. Well, and maybe we don't have the numbers on this too, but weren't a lot of women um, castrated while they were in, like had a hysterectomy, yeah, yeah, so that they couldn't get pregnant. Or have yeah, I think or... that like a lot of times ab- abortion also meant like uterus and everything is coming out. So our girl, when she finds out Stanislava, when she finds out that this is what they're expecting of her, that she is going to help these women give birth, grow through, go through an hours long process with these women, birth a baby, and then she's going to be asked to kill the baby. She refuses and she's a prisoner herself she could be killed right like she doesn't she's not really in a position to refuse anything um so she is taken to the doctor who oversees the entire camp and she again refuses and um one of the women who talked about this in an oral history said why they did not kill her right then and there no one knows so she resists Despite threats, despite beatings, she simply just cares for women and cares for their babies. And she knows that within a few hours, those babies are going to be killed, but it's not going to be her that does it. And um, so she saves as many of the mother's lives. She focuses on the moms because if she can help them get to a point where they give birth and they're healthy and can go back to being you know, survive. camp victims, then the moms can survive. And that becomes sort of her, her, tunnel vision. her tunnel vision on how can I save as many... I mean, she's a doctor. Yeah. She's sworn to save as many people's lives as possible. And so that's sort of the vision that she... Like, the tunnel vision. Yeah, great wording that she adopts. There's lice. There's disease. I mean, it's a concentration camp. It's, it's not filthy. like... It's disgusting. Um, there Sometimes there'd be inches of water on the floor when it rained. Um... Some people estimate that she delivered 3,000 babies in the concentration camp during her two years. Um, She continued to refuse to kill babies despite repeated orders to to do so. Um, Joseph Mengele, Dr. Joseph Mengele, have you heard of him before? He is like the most notorious of the Nazi doctors because he's the one who did all the experiments. experiments. Yes. Okay. And he always wanted twins. Like he he always wanted identical twins. Yep. So he could test, you know, if we do this to anyone with mental disease. Yeah. Yeah. He also did a lot of studies on um, Polish women and Jewish women um, because, you know, sexism and all those sort of things, they were, they were expendable, but um, she even stood up to him directly what? and said she wouldn't do it, which I thought He's was really to cool. Be like the dark lord of everything within these camps. Like, that is the person you don't stand up against. So, not all the babies were like immediately executed. So, she did help give birth to 3,000, and who knows how many of those babies survived. One thing that's interesting is that um, the Nazis begin adopting babies um, as part like taking these babies from yes. these women and and they're stealing right this isn't like oh yeah, yeah I don't want my baby here yeah. signing it away but like they're giving them to basically German women who couldn't have children right yeah yeah so um and you know they estimate that they kidnapped like a hundred thousand babies from Poland alone that are being oh. raised in Germany which is crazy um so one thing that she started doing was tattooing the babies so that if by chance they survive, they can get reunited with their actual mothers later on in life. Wow. Um, other women chose, so this is harsh. And I, again, if you can't listen, just be warned. Some women chose to kill their babies themselves because they didn't want their babies to die at the hands of Nazis. Well, that would be given up to a Nazi family to be raised. Yeah. Some non-Jewish women were allowed to keep their babies, but obviously they're raising babies in... In a concentration camp where there's no food, 
There's no good shell. You can't imagine their milk production is super great. No. Um, imagine trying to care for a screaming baby in a I, concentration camp. You and can't like even. Your job is to be silent at nighttime, and like, and then you're supposed to work all day, like, and you have a baby to care for, and you're supposed to be a worker, like, oh my god. The Nazis forced the inmates to leave Auschwitz on sort of the infamous death march to other camps, and she refuses to leave. And so she ends up staying in Auschwitz and is there when it's liberated by by the Americans. Americans. Yeah. So her legacy lives on long after um, Auschwitz. And I just wanted to read one thing that um, a, a woman who... Uh, gave birth, and this woman was her midwife. Her name was Maria Saloaman. She said, To this day, I do not know at what price she delivered my baby. My baby owes her life to Stanislawa Leschiska. I cannot think of her without tears coming to my eyes. And I just thought that that was incredibly beautiful. Um, she was nominated as a saint in Poland in the oh. Catholic Church, which I thought was really cool. Um, but obviously she's just an amazing woman who put her own li- life on the line to save as many lives as and humanly possible. Cause that she had set to stone to do, you know? Yeah, so from go. I am a midwife. My job in, in this universe will be to bring babies into this world, come hell or high water, and if my life will be the cause of that, uh, the cost of that if I can't do it the right way. Right. Incredible. 100,000 but then it makes you think how many people were actually in Auschwitz, which is an astronomical number. Right, right. Brooke, it's tough to talk about these things, but it's also like one of those things where you see that women are powerful and badass. And yeah, and like came came to bring it, like came to fight. They were present in this moment and they should be known. Yeah. That's an incredible story and, and one that we should hear of. But wouldn't be able to if we looked to the histories because the histories are focusing on what the prime minister was doing, what the president was doing, right? And and let's tell the story as it's lived and experienced. Yeah. And yeah. And we get those we get women's history in when we look to those oral histories and those primary accounts. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Um, so this really gets me thinking about what's currently happening in America today. Yeah. Um, with the story of um, the female midwife that came forward from the detention centers. Yeah, ICE detention centers on the yeah, border. Which I like how we call them detention centers when they're very similar to concentration camps. Yeah, a little bit. So, well, minus the gas chambers, hopefully. Yeah, but more migrant women have come forward to say that they have not consented to these surgeries. And so, if you don't know about what's currently happening, there are many women who are being detained across the border um, in the United States and are being forced to have hysterectomies or essentially female castration so that they don't have children or any menopausal issues while in the detention center. Or at least that's what's alleged. That's what's alleged. It's what's being presented by the current um, midwife that has come forward, nurse that has come forward and is uh, considered the whistleblower in this case. But there's more to come on that. But it's very, you know, if you're doing current events, this would be a great segue of, like, this was happening then, this is happening now. Let's talk about where we stand on this. Yeah. Which is really interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful to that woman to come forward and talk oh about gosh. it. And even if it's just one person who had a hysterectomy without, you Their know, consent. giving full consent. It doesn't consent. need to be multiple women. It's, yeah. It's, they're on American soil and being treated this way. Yeah. That's a problem. Yeah, it's a serious problem. It doesn't matter what soil they're on. And also the woman that came forward is... She is an immigrant herself and has become a U.S. citizen. Oh, wow. I didn't realize yeah. that part of the story. Wow. The Associated Press had uh, reviewed four women's medical records and interviews with lawyers that revealed growing allegations that a men performed surgeries and other procedures on the detained immigrants that had never sought or didn't fully understand what was being performed on them. Yeah, and I, I imagine they're dealing with all sorts of language barriers and those types of things. But if you're going to do, like, a hysterectomy, that so is... By law, you have to have um, a translator in the room yeah. to do any medical procedures. I used to work at a hospital that was like, we couldn't even... 
have a patient come and be seen if we didn't have a translator available for them. And New Hampshire has a ton of immigrant populations here and refugees. Yeah. Um, in Manchester, New Hampshire is a huge, it's a relocation city, which means we have a giant population of refugees that speak multiple languages. Right. We had to find medical translators in every one of those languages to be able to provide medical care to any patient that came into our hospital. Yeah. So the fact that, like, we're a tiny-ass hospital in the middle of New Hampshire that had to do that, I'd imagine a large hospital in Texas would have to do the same. Right. So these women should Or one that's at a detention center. Exactly. Specializing. (laughs) Yeah. Like, no, no. uh, They should know exactly what's happening to their bodies and be very understanding about what the procedure is that they're being presented with. Yeah. When I had surgery last year... um, you know, one of the possible outcomes was that I would have to have a hysterectomy if things go poorly. Oh, my God. And I remember the feeling of, like, understanding what, what that meant, that meant yeah. you know, and being like, okay, so one child and done. Yep, in this moment. And I have to decide now, right now. You know, like that's a real that's a really heavy thing. And it was the information was being delivered to me by people that I trusted. And that spoke your language. Spoke my language in an environment yeah. that's clean that I, you know in a country that you're familiar with. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So um so that's a really big situation that we're following and like reading more on to see how this court case ends up. But this isn't old that women's bodies are, you know, these things are happening to them. Yeah. Well, and that reproduction being in their control can can kind of make them a target, yeah, right? Absolutely. And a victim. And a victim, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you for bringing up that parallel because I think it's an important one. Well, I'm Brooke Sullivan. I'm Kelsey Eckert. Thanks, Kels. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.